Um, we are in a section of the book of Matthew where Jesus is blowing up the false notion of righteousness that existed within the Jewish people who were listening to him. And that had been cultivated by the scribes and the Pharisees. It was a legalistic ideology that said if you could keep all the commandments that God had given in the Old Testament, then you were righteous and just. But in order to do that, they had made it a very external thing and not a heart thing. So today, we go into an area that, frankly, is a little painful for most of us. It'd be one thing if we were just talking about adultery, but the fact is that God connects it to something far deeper and takes us into this area of sensual, sexual sin. Um, and, and so as I have prepared for this, I've prayed for you as I've prayed for my own heart. Um, and I'm praying that it will end up being very encouraging. The last two weeks ago, we talked about the issue of murder, which really led us to an understanding that if you have been angry with someone, you've committed murder. And boy, there goes our, you know, well, I didn't kill anybody. Well, yeah, you did. You did it in your heart. And, and there we are, convicted before God. And today... You've heard it said you should not commit adultery. But Jesus will go on and say, but I say to you, anyone who even looks at another person with lust for them has already committed it in their heart. Uh, I have a quote that I want to put up there this morning. It's actually by John MacArthur. It's out of his commentary. He says this, Anger and sexual lust are two of the most powerful influences on mankind. The person who gives them reign will soon find that he is more controlled than in control. Everybody agree with that? Absolutely. So, man, as Jesus begins to dismantle our kind of false idea of righteousness, he starts right at the core issues. Issues of our relationships with others and how we might think that we are being righteous before God when in fact... We're already condemned and convicted. You know, uh, it's an interesting topic because he goes right into this issue of adultery. I found out something fascinating. There's been several studies to do about this. Did you know that according to Americans, the most unacceptable thing that you could do is cheat on your spouse? Think of the world we live in right now and all of the humdingers out there, the big baddies you're not supposed to do, but they rank cheating on your spouse more awful than abortion, than getting pregnant out of wedlock, of divorce, of all these social things where people might say, oh, it's not great, but you have freedom to do it. They said the worst thing that you could do would be to have an affair or cheat on your spouse. However, are any of you aware that people are still doing this? And the problem is, people may think that social norm is still strong. This is not even the church we're talking about. We're just talking about society in general. But the problem is, they all become their own determiner of what righteous good people do and don't do. Therefore, I self-justify why I would do anything in the relationships I have. I make up the rules. So we all may agree that uh, adultery is a bad thing. Certainly the Jews understood it as a very bad thing that God prohibited. But the question is, what version of righteousness is running your life? Yours or God's? And so Jesus begins to just press into this issue. And the great danger that I think that is revealed is that our definition of righteousness continues to miss the mark of God, doesn't it? How many of you know that you like to self-justify? How many of you know you're smart and they're dumb? Right? I mean, it's just like, yeah. And we come up with all our own rules for this. 
Uh, One uh, writer put it this way, we routinely give ourselves, listen to this, a very narrow definition of sexual sin, while we give ourselves a rather broad definition of sexual purity. Meaning, to really blow it before God is to commit one of the three or four biggies. You had an affair. You committed adultery. You slept with someone before you were married. You did one of the bad ones. You're not pure before God. And yet when you come to God's definition of sexual sin, He goes, you are thinking of this as an external problem. He goes, I'm talking about my righteousness at the core of your being. It's a heart issue. And so we tend to take sexual sin, even though we would say certain things are really bad, and we kind of create categories that we feel safe about, and like, I'm not a really bad person because I've never done this, that, or anything. And what we like to do is we like to take God's righteousness and make it very fuzzy. Blur the lines a little bit. Give yourself room to be a good person. I mean, you haven't done that, and you're not doing that, at least not regularly, so it's all good. Today in verse 27, he says, You've heard it said you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, Jesus replies, that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. There is nothing unfuzzy about that statement. And yet somehow in our heart we want to create unusual little categories that give us a little room. Well, I wasn't really looking in that way, or I wasn't this or wasn't that. So, uh, how many of you are familiar with C.S. Lewis? C.S. Lewis, in a very funny way, addressed this. And this is what he said in one of his writings. I love it. He says, But he that looketh upon a plate of ham and eggs to lust after it hath already committed breakfast with it in his heart. We all clear? If you look upon something with lust, then the reality is that the sin has already been committed in your heart. Now, I want to say this. Jesus will include us all in what he's saying today. And the whole point of the Sermon on the Mount is to drive you back to the very first sentence. Blessed are the poor in spirit. I have no idea how you walked in here today. I don't know your addictions. I don't know your struggles. I don't know your past. I don't know who did what to you. I don't know what you did to them, but you do. And whenever we bring up sexual sin in a church context, it all floods up. And all, listen to me, of our misunderstanding Not because we're bad people, but our confusion about righteousness comes right to the surface. There's probably not more personal issue than we can talk about. So I am not doing this flippantly today, and you need to know that my deepest prayer is that this passage would drive you and me to the amazing grace of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen? Amen? All right. So let's dive in. The big problem is that when it comes to righteousness, and Jesus hits it again in this topic, is the problem of compartmentalization. How many of you know we like things in manageable little bite-sized chunks? Especially our sin. We like to categorize it. We like to have it in a place where we can say, well, I took that bite, but I didn't take that bite. And so I'm good. And when Jesus brings this up in verse 27, he says, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. Well, you better believe they'd heard it said. Did you know that that is a direct quote from the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament? It is quoting directly the the seventh commandment, which says, you shall not commit adultery. Of course they'd heard it. But why does Jesus not say The law says, because he's honing in on what they had all been taught. 
See, most of them didn't sit under the reading of the law. What they got was a rabbi's interpretation of it, or a scribe, or a Pharisee. That was as close as they got to hearing these things. And so he's saying, you've heard the rabbis, the Pharisees, the scribes tell you this. You shall not commit adultery. And so you need to know that the rabbis, the Pharisees, the scribes loved this. Isn't it so black and white? If you don't commit adultery, you're righteous. But if you do, you're evil. Doesn't, isn't that clean things up? Take away all the... I mean, literally, they loved it. It was categorical. It was legalistic. And they could hold anybody they wanted to to it. And they could tell themselves, I am righteous before God because I have not done this outward act of sin. That was the tradition. However, it is really interesting that they stopped at the seventh commandment and they didn't go on to the tenth. Because the tenth commandment says, do not covet your neighbor's wife. The law does not stop on the exterior of our life, you guys. It goes to the interior of our heart. Well, Nobody, no scribes were teaching on do not covet your neighbor's wife. They were just saying, as long as you don't touch her or him, you're perfectly fine. So it was a very, very dangerous position. And frankly, it was one that was so convenient. And I need to tell you, our righteousness so often conveniently makes the outward act of sin the total sum total of sexual sin. As long as you don't do it, in reality, you're not guilty of it. i got to tell you, I was convicted this week of some self-righteousness. I hope you can laugh when you hear it. How many of you have gone to the doctor's office and they make you fill out the whole questionnaire? You know, which in my family is like just basically draw a line through yes. You know, it's a miracle I'm breathing. Yes, here we are. But... They always sit down, and you know the nurse gives you the whole interview? Does she walk you through the couple key questions? And every time I go into that, I'm always sort of smiling to myself, because I know what they're going to ask me. Do you smoke? No. Do you drink? No. Not even socially? No. You want to know why? Because I'm good enough, and I'm smart enough, and doggone it, God likes me more than you. You're like, you would never think that. Not really on the surface, but I always kind of smile when I'm going into those things. You guys, I've been a diabetic for 30 years. There's reasons I don't drink socially that are not sin or anything, but they're the reality that like on the list of things that they do to say, are you a healthy person or not? I'm always answering, no, no, I don't do those things. I'm a model citizen. (laughs) You know, I just, it's like, oh, because, because I can't check the box. But what if that wasn't what they asked? Do you struggle with forgiveness? Do you walk around with seething anger behind your eyes? Is your anxiety level through the roof because of what you can't control? They don't ask you those questions. But if they did, they would probably get to the conclusion that I'm not as healthy as I think. How about you? Think about it. If you stay in this compartmentalized place, then you will miss everything that Jesus is driving at. And you will fall into a version of righteousness that's your own, and your own version of righteousness, friend, is killing you. It's destroying you. In fact, if you stay on this surface level of righteousness, especially, hear me, church, especially when it comes to sexual struggle and sin, the worst is that you will begin to categorically put yourself in a place of above those who've struggled. You'll begin to have a devaluing sort of self-righteousness, and it will play out around you. How many of you know it's very easy to segment people into clean and unclean? We do it all the time. It's so broken. Oh, you did it. You weren't a virgin. Come on. Bet you haven't told anybody here. Porn addict? Shh. 
How many marriages is this for you? Let's talk. I'm not going to back away from our shame today, folks. Because I carry my own. And it comes out. And the thing is, in a sick way, our flesh will press down against what we know is true and will begin to categorize people around us and treat them like I'm here, but you're here, and it's terrible. How many remember in John 8 when they dragged a woman caught in adultery before Jesus? Remember that story? You guys, the whole thing was a setup. It was to trap Jesus. They all had stones in their hand, and they're like, hey, she's been caught in adultery. What should we do, teacher? And what they wanted him to say was either let her go, because then he would fail the law, or kill her, because then they could make him a tyrant. But they were sitting there with rocks, ready to kill this woman. And Jesus, you need to know, Jesus was never like, whoa, what do I do? (laughs) Oh my. He's like, you know, I planned this moment from eternity, so I'm ready. He says, whichever one of you is without sin, go ahead and throw the first stone. You guys, it's so easy to make yourself more righteous than others because of what you've done and what you haven't done. And it is deadly. By the way, if you grew up in a church like that, I'm sorry. I can't take you back there. I can't remove legalism from the heart of your parent that's haunting you till this day. I can't take you out of that judgmental moment that you had. I can tell you some hard things. They weren't wrong that you're a sinner. They were just wrong about the way they were sinning too. Um, This is really interesting. Um, What happens is, how many of you know that we all feel a little guilty about the sin in our life? Any amens? Any of you feel the weight? And this area just feels like a ton. We don't need any help from anybody else condemning us, do we? It's like it's brutal enough. But what happens is we either go the legalism route or we go the route of I'll just hide for the rest of my life. Jesus Christ died on the cross, forgave my sins. I'm a Christian, but I sit in this room and no one knows my story or my struggle because I can't fix it. I don't know what to do. Or I've I've got a wound and I don't know what to do. And I got to tell you, one of the best passages you can go to if you want to write something down, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Friends, don't don't think that for a moment God's grace has to do with telling you that you didn't sin or what got broken wasn't broke. In fact, the sin that is in our life condemns us before a holy God and should by all rights send us to a Christless eternity. We're guilty doesn't matter what kind of deviant sexual sin you got involved to. Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, homosexuals, thieves, covetousness, drunkards, revilers, or swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Can I just tell you guys for a second? Do not be afraid to let God draw the line. Because your drawing the line is killing you. It is an exhaustion, and it is beyond your pay grade. Anybody say amen? You and I don't define righteousness. God does. He defines it. 11, such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. Oh, friends, it was that moment, not when you got yourself all cleaned up, it was the moment you became poor in spirit and came to God and said, I did it, I broke it, I struggle with it, here it is. 
I have no rescue but you, Jesus. I need your salvation. And you, you came to Christ, and in that moment, friends, you were justified. You were washed. When God the Father looks upon you, he sees the pristine righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ. Everybody say amen to that. That's good news. That's good news. And some of you sit here and go, but I'm still struggling. Huh. I just want to give you a taste of grace. Huh. Some of you are like, but I, I'm, I'm still, it's her. I'm not sure how to get, I'm still, I, so I'm ashamed. I'm hiding from it. Stop. You see, if you weren't belonging to Jesus Christ, you'd be fine. You'd have a little larceny, a little sin going on the outside, a little dabble here and there, show up, put your happy face on, and you could just walk through it. But you are miserable because you belong to Jesus. Somebody say amen to that. It is not the condemnation of your life to find out that you belong to God. And guess what? He has said, I'm going to perfect you. I'm not going to leave you in that place. That which I began in you, this good work, I'm going to perfect it. You know what you need to do? Quit fighting his version of righteousness. Some of you are like, I just need to be strong enough to get rid of all... I just, I just got to clip it all. I've got to do it. I've got to get the... Stop! How about today, by the grace of God, we agree with Jesus? And we lean into his grace and his power through the Holy Spirit. I want to show you this a couple times. I'm telling you, there is nothing more damning and damaging in the church than the guilt of sin that cannot be confessed and repented of. I was teaching a group of, believe it or not, several hundred college students a couple years, several years ago. And I don't know if I would ever do this in church. Virginia was no college. College students, we just get away with whatever. It's awesome. But in the middle of this sermon, I said, okay, I just want you guys to know, and in a moment, I'm going to ask you all to stand up. And I would like all the virgins to go to that side of the room. And I would like to everybody else to go to that side of the room. And then I just sat there in silence. And I listened to the crying. And I watched guys who I knew were studying for ministry with their heads in their laps. One of my favorite comments about this verse was written by John Stott, one of the most profound commentary and Christian writers you will hear ever. And he said, he quotes the verse and then his commentary goes, oh, I say it aloud with shame. Because we've all sinned. You know what I did right after that? Nobody got up. I preached the gospel and the saving grace of Jesus Christ. We had people come forward who were carrying such burden of broken, and I just watched them go, Gah! and it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Amen? Amen? It was such a cool moment. But I've got to tell you, we, we, there's such a danger. Church, can we just, just be honest? We're still scared of our unrighteousness. It is not wrong to hate it and to desire God to do with it, but when it molds you and it shapes you and it keeps you contained, then you're missing the power of the Gospel. These people, Jesus is taking them to the mat because they had locked themselves into a system that didn't get to know God any better, just left them condemned forever. Say, so how do I know? Well, verse 28 defines the whole process of this sin issue pretty clearly. Jesus says, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her is already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, by the way, you could say any woman who looks at a man, would it would be any of us here. But Jesus is making a strong point. And the first thing you need to understand, it's inclusive. Um, can I just tell you, don't fight God's indictment. Don't be afraid to find yourself in need of Jesus. Amen, church? 
We fight so hard to be the one-off and the exception to the rule. I've told you this before. My dad had this great mug, and it sat on his desk, and it was surrounded. It was just all these cartoon penguins all the way around the mug. And my dad's name was John, just like me. And, and on this mug, there was one penguin that had a sombrero on. And it simply says, one in a million. <laughs> I love that. Can I tell you guys something? You're not one in a million. Everyone who has lusted after anyone in any shape or any capacity is guilty of the totality of unrighteousness. You are an adulterer. Just like if you've been angry, you are a murderer. And Jesus doesn't leave anyone out. Everyone, he says. And what is it exactly that happens, this lustful look? By the way, right off the bat, how many of you know that it is not wrong to notice beauty? We are visual. God created us for joy. It is not sin to notice someone who is attractive. And I've had people, well, it's not sin to look at somebody and say, well, that's beautiful. Here's what I do know. How many of you can judge the time it takes to go from an appreciation of beauty to a lustful look? So if that's your defense, oh, I've seen things, but if, you know, I was just noticing beauty. Right. Because it takes not even a second, nanoseconds, to in your heart completely complete the entire cycle of adultery. So don't, so don't try to duck it or rename it. Of course we know there's beauty, and it's not wrong to notice beauty in the world. What is wrong is when the flesh engages. The lust he's talking here is a deep-seated lust which kind of consumes and devours. I know this is strong language, but which in imagination attacks and rapes which mentally contemplates and commits adultery. What you really need to know, and this is should, I hope this is informative to you, is that lust is when we are engaged in sinful imagination. Lust is when we engage in sinful imagination. Probably the greatest uh, example, sadly, in the Old Testament certainly, is we're all familiar with David and Bathsheba, aren't we? And when you think about what happened there, in the, in the days, in the spring, when kings should go off to war, David takes a stroll on the upper deck of his palace. He looks down. He sees Bathsheba. She is bathing. And in a moment, his look of notice did not embarrass him to get off the roof. He stopped, and it became a leer. And it became a want and a desire, and he fulfilled the entire act in his mind, and he was not content to stop till he had done it in reality. In fact, I don't know if you've ever noticed this. Do you remember his servant was standing there with him? And you remember what the servant kindly tried to say to him? Uh, Your majesty, that's the wife of Uriah the Hittite. <laughs> I'm just saying, you're the king, can do whatever you want, but that's another man's wife. Ears turned off. And he went through with it. And that is what happens when we think about lust. It is when I commit sensual sin in my imagination. In fact, uh, Kent Hughes, great writer, he said, no sin was ever committed that was not first imagined. Now, I want to speak to you all pretty directly because I think this is helpful in the battle against it. You guys... Our culture, the North American culture, worships entertainment. We give them the highest platform, actors, to speak to social issues in our culture. All of this is true. We worship at entertainment, but entertainment has been driving towards fantasy at a rampant place. Would any of you agree with me? And what it is trying to do is it's trying to disconnect your concept of morality from any accountability whatsoever. Therefore, everything that is being produced, whether in gaming, whether in shows, whether in any of the things that frankly are good and fun and enjoyable, have just been front-loaded with this idea of if we can just disconnect you 
from the person being human that you are thinking about, then it's fine. Hey, young people, I just want to shock you. Did you know there was a day when vampires weren't sexy? They weren't. Aliens were not sensual. Superheroes were not known for their latex outfits. They were known for being good while other things were evil. Have you noticed that that is no longer the case? And what is the conquest? And what is the, the re reality that comes with that is, friends, it is presently so easy for us to lust and think we haven't violated anything because what we're looking at is not real. Young men and women who have grown up in a gaming culture, you know this to be true. The best games are all rated M for maturity. It's so hard to, to walk with your kids through gaming these days because everything that is the best, and frankly it is the best, the best graphics, the best interaction, the best uh, gaming online with your friends, it's all in the realm of mature now. But after all, you're just killing vampires and it's not, well, what are we doing? We begin to feed an imagination. This is why God says, do not long be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world. Be renewed by the transforming of your... Friends, what are you letting cultivate your fantasy life right now? Think about that. I'm not sitting here railing against, this isn't a legalistic... I'm just saying, are you aware that we have an enemy, the prince of the power of the air, and nothing going on is random? And its whole thing is to indict you and keep you a functional adulterer while pretending to be righteous and strolling into church and assuming why, why do I not feel satisfied, God? I keep pre I'm praying, I'm doing this, and I'm doing all these things that seem sort of innocuous to me. You know, I watch this show, I, I, I play this game, I do all this stuff, and why does God feel so far away? Because you are playing at a wrong version of righteousness. And there is no joy there. There is no satisfaction there. It is empty. When God says, taste and see that the Lord is good, He's talking about the one thing only He can bring, and that is righteousness. And it is the most satisfying, powerful agent in the world. And the crazy thing is that God wants it in your heart. <laughs> Anybody say, bummer? One writer said, you know, thus God looks upon the heart in which, alas, what is not committed. So, hopefully this strips us down. God always is doing this. He's knocking out self-righteousness and our flesh. And he gets, if, if you can let him indict you today and say, have you lusted? Yes. Then you are, you are guilty before a holy God. It, 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 you know, and, and let him say, okay, now I want to show you my righteousness and I want you to be zealous for it. I want you to pursue it with passion. You guys, you're never going to pursue God's righteousness if you keep defining it. You won't. You'll reach your level of it. I was good today. Made it the whole day. Woo! Only to bomb the next day. This isn't about sinless perfection. This is about experiencing the righteousness of Christ. And yet, for those of us who didn't get it, we get to the end of this and God gives us His prescription. His prescription. Verse 29 and 30 mirror them each other. Jesus says, here's the prescription for righteousness. Here's what I want you to do. If your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it away from you. For it is better to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it away from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Now, time out. Do you think Jesus is supporting self-mutilation? You know how I know that? If he was, he would say, rip out both your eyes. 
because they'll both do the job, right? Cut off both your hands because you can sin with either one. He is really pressing us to consider what is most cherished and what is most valuable, listen to this church, in our definition of self-righteousness, in our definition of strength, in our definition of worth. I'll be honest, there are parts of my life where I have spent the entirety of my life trying to handle my sin apart from Jesus Christ. And it has been an empty endeavor and sad and depressing. And God is saying a lot of things that you lean into, that you're propping yourself up with, or even the freedoms you give yourself, He's saying, don't do that. And I think three things that I would say. First, you've got to get real about how deadly sexual sin is. Friends, our whole culture is telling you that sexual sin, sexual identification, all that stuff, it's your prerogative, it's your world, don't worry about what anybody thinks. Certainly don't think that God would have anything to say to you about this. You define what's good for you and go forth. <laughs> sexual interaction, both internally and externally, apart from God's righteousness, has the most power to destroy people of anything I've ever seen. Proverbs 3, 5, uh, 5, 3 through 5 says, For the lips of the adulteress drip honey and are smoother than oil, but in the end she is bitter wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death, her steps lay hold of Sheol. Friends, two things are true about immorality one it will destroy you you've all got a testimony of someone and you've watched how persons fall from they get destroyed and even in a culture that says you can do whatever you want it still destroys you it'll kill you the other thing is that it is fast setting fantasy i always joke with you guys it's rice cakes that will kill you. <laughs> I, I want to give you an illustration. Maybe this is helpful to you. I hope it's not too disturbing. Let's say you come over to my house. I've invited you all over, but you're there. Into, okay, we're at my house. You all hear I have a new grandson? It's pretty awesome. I'm enjoying it. See, I said, oh, you got to see, you got to see my little guy, Robbie. Come on out. I want to show you. He's, he's doing the cutest thing. How many of you know that toddlers are adorable when they play in dirt? Can I just say something to you uptight parents? Let them eat dirt. It's good for the digestive system. They, they, they get in it and they get a mess. Before you freak out about having to clean something up, you'll always have to clean something up. Let them play in the dirt. But let's say he's out there and he's making mud pies. And, and it's so fun to watch a toddler do that. They're just creating their imagination. They don't even talk. You know, you know, and they go on and on. It's so much fun. But what if you walked out in my backyard and my grandson was playing in wet concrete? And I was sitting there talking to you. It's, it's just the cutest, oh my word. You're like, that's concrete. I know, we were going to like extend the patio. This is so much more entertaining. You know, look at it, just making mud pies. And you're like, John, don't you understand that that stuff's going to suck the moisture. It's going to crack his hands. He's going to be bleeding in seconds. You don't get him out of there. John, that's deadly. What are you doing? That's your fantasy life. And it is quick setting concrete. And what is imagined still seems to have the power to hold you fast in reality. It's deadly. And God, even as believers, do you think a good, loving father wants to leave you in a place where you bleed and your hands cracked and your life begins to be immobilized by something he already paid for on the cross? It was for freedom that Christ set you free. Can you be struggling with these sins as a believer? Absolutely. Can you yield to the flesh? Absolutely. Are you today defined by your sin? No. You are defined and owned and valued as a child of the living God, bought by the blood of Jesus Christ, 
justified before him and a Holy Spirit living within you, which is the power to walk in a different direction. And it happens when you agree, yes, God, this is unrighteousness. God, you died for this. I don't want to be in this, but I need your help to walk in a new way. So what do I need to do? I need to get radical about sin. That means getting radical about your need for the Holy Spirit's help. What do I mean by that? Well, this. When he talks about your right hand and your right eye, he's being very, very specific. He's saying that thing that you have valued that trips you up, makes you stumble, scandalizon, it's a great, great Greek word. God wants you to be specific about what trips you up, and then he wants you to be spendy in your willingness to deal with it. I'm telling you, if you guys want to experience freedom, it's not eradicating the fact that you struggle with lust. It is beginning to trust God in the battle and begin to let the Holy Spirit begin to help you and and, and you get spendy about it and you get brothers and sisters around you. I would tell you, you would be shocked to find out that the needle has so shifted that it is not a great distance between now today men struggling with sexual sin and pornography and women because we're all so accessible on our phones. And I'm sorry if you have a little girl and she's only seven, eight, nine years old and she sees things, that will be part, it will affect her and she will have to deal with that fight even though God wired us differently. So let's not be afraid that sin is awful, it can tail you down, it can hurt you, but God has forgiven us from it. Let's start attacking it and not be afraid to get some help. Can I just tell you guys something? There'd probably be a day I would have kept this information to myself. On my computer, you'll find a program running. It's called Covenant Eyes. I have an accountability partner. He's in this church. He sees everything that I see on my computer. This is not me standing before you in self-righteousness. I just told you as your pastor, I have a device on my computer because I am susceptible to sin. And I want to just tell you guys something. That as I have allowed God to be my partner, it has not stopped me from vulnerability. It has actually opened my heart up to stop being afraid of sin. Guess what? Jesus Christ paid for my sin. And in my growth, I have learned that the most beautiful thing that can happen is that if I walk into my house at night, I've got some responsibilities. I'm supposed to be a dad. I'm supposed to be a husband. I'm supposed to be into my kid's life. I'm supposed to be concerned what's going on. Do you know what happens when we treat things with our version of righteousness? Well, I had a good day. I didn't sin so much. Sin solidifies. And if you struggle during the day and you see something, you build up. It doesn't matter whether you identify or not. You will walk into your house and instead of being present, you will hide. And you will hope that certain things don't come up. And instead of being engaged, when God has set you free to love your wife and love your kids, you can step back and just avoid them for fear that you might be found out. That you might trip. Somebody might see it. You know what is a beautiful thing? To come home because God's partnership during the day, and though I'm not celebrating it every moment, just to be present and hungry for God. You know what? When God says, taste and see that the Lord is good, some of you, the world has lied to you. Almost it says your sensual experience is the best it's ever got. Do you know how amazing righteousness is. And when you know it's not your own and you should never get any of it because you're a stinking sinner just like your pastor. And all of a sudden, you follow Christ and, and, and you get expensive about the things you put out. i got to stop because we got to have communion. I'm going to share this last thing. So when I was a kid... Uh, how many of you remember when televisions operated this way? Dish, 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 dish. <laughs> there was no phones. There was nothing. It was just a huge tube unit and everything. So imagine, me and my four siblings, it's Saturday morning. 
It's 11 o'clock. We've been watching cartoons for six hours. <laughs> We've totally ignored our chores. We have just been saturated. And my dad walks in the room, and what's playing is a show we were told we were not supposed to watch. My dad walks over, and he grabs the television, and he rips it out of the wall. Not a flat screen, some of you. <laughs> this is a two. And I just remember kicking open the door, and he walks down the hallway, and we're like, what's, what's happening? What's happening? And then we all get in the window as little kids, and we watch him. He's walking towards the dumpster, flips the lid open, chucks the television in, comes back, and he sits us down, and we're all lined up. And he's like, this house will not be ruled by sin and laziness. There's a reason I haven't forgot that. Some of you are like, well, that's just cutting off your right hand. You can still sin and everything. No, though true. How many of you would be willing to throw out the flat screen? Not because flat screens are evil, but just for this, because you personally need help. What might God ask you today to take a step because you're forgiven, because you're loved, because you belong to Him, and your righteousness is not your own? What journey may He ask you to start and take a step and push it away from you, not in your own strength, not hypocritically? And what might God set you loose to experience of His righteousness this fall. I pray you will get alone with the Lord and just say, see God, what am I tripping on? I don't want my version of righteousness. It stinks. I don't like what it does to my relationships. I don't like where it's leading me. I don't want to live in that trap. I want Christ. Amen, church? I'm with you. I'm not yet what I will be, but by the grace of God, I look a little bit more like him than I did. Amen? And that's the joy. Let's pray. Father, this is deep territory, but God, it is where you have come to set us free. Lord, first of all, don't let us be afraid of righteousness today, of what you really say about sexual sin. But God, then don't let us believe we're sufficient for it. Let us be poor in spirit. And then God, may we take a step towards you. I pray that we won't take steps alone. Lord, we have brothers and sisters in our life who want to walk with us. We are forgiven by grace. Our righteousness is Christ. God, would you do in us a freeing, fantastic work. And may we see and taste that you are good. We pray these things in the name of our Savior, who is our righteousness, Jesus Christ, and all God's people said, Amen.